I'm Becca Hoppiger in for Alex tonight. We first want to address the breaking news. A grand jury in New York indicted former President Trump. It's the first time a former U.S. president will face criminal prosecution. While the charges are still unknown, the former president's defense attorney says Trump will likely appear in court early next week. The Manhattan District Attorney's Office has been looking into whether the former president falsified records to hide a $130,000 payment to porn star Stormy Daniels. Trump's former attorney, Michael Cohen, who already faced prison time for facilitating this payment, says the payment was meant to keep an affair with the porn star quiet so the chances of winning the presidency would not be damaged. Now, a grand jury has formally found enough evidence to determine Trump was involved in a crime, they say. We will have more on this story tonight at 11 with reaction to the grand jury and an interview with Representative Adam Schiff, who has led the impeachment efforts against the former president. And now to tonight's main point. Your compassion is changing lives. Last week, we brought you the powerful story of a Sacramento woman who decided to take action in the face of the homeless crisis. During the pandemic, she built four tiny homes in her backyard, established a nonprofit organization, and now provides temporary shelter for unhoused families. Well, you stepped up. In direct response to our reporting, all sorts of people came out of the woodwork to offer help to her. Tonight, we're showing you just what that set in motion. Thank you. I don't know if I could have found me if it wasn't for you, God. An embrace of gratitude from Christina Talley, who, along with her daughter, are no longer unhoused thanks to the help of Robin Moore and her nonprofit, We Force of California, Inc., which operates Safe Harbor. By the end of this month, we should have our 20th family that has come down that Safe Harbor path. It's a campus literally in Moore's backyard with four tiny homes where families experiencing homelessness stay up to 90 days while earning enough money at their job to afford to get into an apartment. Tally graduated from the program and is now in stable housing. I'm like, I deserve this and they're telling me that I do. In response to this story, Moore says she has received dozens of calls. A lot of calls came in, a lot of donations came in. People want to help. Moore's nonprofit partners with another nonprofit called Family Promise of Sacramento, which launched in 2005. We've been very fortunate to have over 350 families graduate our program. Marsha Spell is executive director here. She says there's a spectrum of folks who are unhoused. These nonprofits help families who are just on the verge of being able to get back into housing. It could be credit, it could be losing a job, it could be being evicted, it could be the landlord selling their property. And then all of a sudden, you don't have first last. It drives you to your uh, hotel where you're trying to shelter yourself and your family and before you know it, you're in a cycle of just paying the hotel for a roof over your head. Family Promise of Sacramento does the intake and screening plus ongoing case management of the families who are eventually sent to Safe Harbor in Moore's own backyard. We run background checks, drug testing, credit checks. Right now we're the only site for Family Promise, but I, I can foresee this being duplicated because now is the time to do that. Safe Harbor and Family Promise can only house four families at a time for now. I can get 25, 30 intakes a day from people that need our services, where 14, 13 years ago, it might be 50 a month. So we have seen the need grow dramatically. Spell says if others want to do what Moore is doing, Family Promise would be open to partnering with them. We have to get everything approved through our board, but you know, it's a very good possibility of doing that. Why not grow and this is a great way of growing. The homeless crisis can feel so vast and overwhelming. What can any one person possibly do? Turns out a lot more than you might think. I was so honored that ABC 10 would come and give a platform to, I call myself a regular person and I am. It's important for the community to know what's going on, that people are coming together. Moore says she doesn't have a lot, but she has 
enough. Anyone interested in learning more about Tiny Homes as temporary shelter for unhoused families can reach out to Family Promise of Sacramento. Again, they and Safe Harbor have received so much interest in the wake of our reporting last week. They're considering offering a free class on what someone needs to know and do if they might want to be part of the solution in this way. Both nonprofits also accept donations, of course. If you want to get in touch with them for any reason, we have links at abc10.com slash to the point. Just look for the links mentioned article. All right, after 17 years, the drought is over. The Sacramento Kings are finally headed to the NBA playoffs after beating the Portland Trailblazers last night. That also comes with a home court advantage in the first round. The next home game is this Sunday when they take on the Spurs. But the days of those cheap tickets might be over. We were poking around Ticketmaster and only found resale tickets starting at more than 100 bucks a pop for the nosebleeds. And that's not all that's selling out. Devin Truby's got a look at the excitement around the city. Well, Becca, I have some bad news for you. If you wanted one of those 400 playoff t-shirts, they're sold out. They sold out by just about noon today. But if you come inside, lots of people have been packing the Kings fan storm today. We have heard stories of saying this is redemption for what happened in 2006 to the Kings when they played the San Antonio Spurs. For others, it's feeling of bringing their family together and a sense of pride for the city of Sacramento. Take a listen been season ticket holder since 85. My grandpa passed away um, a couple years ago. But they went to like every game and then now we are like going to a lot of games um, as a family. And This year has been different. It's almost like uh, back in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, where I'm just like, was like a kid just getting ready, ready for the games to start. This, no, this, this is different. These guys are their own team. They're, they're marking their own trails and, and, you know, at some point, you'd like to believe they're going to be fighting for a world championship as well. All the fans we spoke to today said they at least want to try and see if they can get tickets to the playoff game. Right now, tickets for the upper section are more than $300, Becca. Bit pricey there, indeed. Well, we've been asking you for your Kings questions and memories all week, and we have a special story to share about some little-known Kings history. We're going back to a point in time in 1986. The Kings were looking for a gym to work out in, and they chose the Athletic Center at Kasumnas River College. The college's head basketball coach at the time, Jim Clark, opened up the Athletic Center to the Kings even though he was a Lakers fan. Clark and the Kings held summer basketball camps for kids with players like Reggie Theus, Olin Polonese, Bobby Jackson, and Wayman Tisdale. Jim Clark then used that experience to secure a new athletic uh, facility for the college, and that's now named Clark Court. We caught up with Jim's daughter today. The legacy is now living on in those men and women that play in that gym right now, today. Um, they're being a part of the Sacramento King history, just playing in there. Um, so it's because of the Kings and my father that that gym is there. And after Clark's death, the family set up the James Clark Memorial Scholarship for continuing student athletes. That's now helped students with almost $20,000 in funds. Thank you so much to Jim's daughter, Dawn, for sharing this story with to the point. And side note, she's the lone Kings fan in her family. Let us know any Kings questions or memories you have by scanning the QR code on the side of your screen. And for all things Kings basketball, check out the Locked On Kings podcast. Our Matt George has a daily wrap of games, headlines, and more. You can listen on the ABC 10 mobile app or watch the video on ABC 10 Plus. Yesterday, we heard from supporters of California's Reparations Task Force. Today, we're hearing from you. We've got your points after the break. Yesterday on To The Point, we talked about California's Reparations Task Force and the $800 billion price tag that economists put on making amends for racial discrimination and slavery. We heard from supporters who showed up for public comment at the meeting. We also heard from a lot of you at home. Alex is hosting an event in Carmichael right now. We'll have more on that later, but she wanted to share some of your comments before she headed out. Okay, many of you had a lot to say about this last night, so I want to let you know I'm still reading your comments and wanted to share some of them today, like this viewer who wrote in and said California was never a slave state, so why? 
We also had another viewer write in and say, as a white woman in her 60s who was raised in a low-income, large Catholic family and does not have a college degree, I absolutely support reparations to the black community. She said that in part. Another person writing in, African Americans are not the only people that have been oppressed. What about the Native Americans who had their land stolen? What about Japanese Americans who were imprisoned and lost their businesses and property? And, and I do want to note here that Japanese Americans who were interned they were compensated. But continuing on with some of the viewer comments here, we had this comment and document actually sent in to us from Pamela out in Fair Oaks. She shared this with us. This is her third great-grandfather's death certificate and has slave designated on it. I mean, you can see it throughout right here. Uh, she sent this in and told us in part, I ask you, how would you feel if you were to see something like that on your relative's death certificate? As for the one individual who called in opposition to the reparations bill, I say this. You may not have personally committed any of the atrocities, but your ancestors did. And you, my friend, continue to benefit from those atrocities every day. Now, we always want to hear your thoughts. Please write in to us. You can still scan that QR code on the bottom of your screen right now, and we'll read them. Coming up after the break, when you think about construction, you might not picture a job site full of women. But well, we're introducing you to some women working to change that. Here are some other stories people are talking about today. Former President Donald Trump has been indicted in relation to payments made during the 2016 presidential campaign to silence claims of an affair with a porn star. This is the first ever criminal case against a former U.S. president, and it comes as Donald Trump is planning to run for president again in 2024. He says he did nothing wrong. Luther Burbank High School in Sacramento went into lockdown today after a large fight on campus. Police say they detained a lot of people. No serious injuries were reported, though. And all that snow in Tahoe is leading to close encounters like this one. Keep Tahoe Blue shared this video of bears coming out of hibernation and walking right up to people's windows. Yeah, the snow is so high, this is the new ground floor. It's a new a good reminder not to keep your food out if you are heading to Tahoe. Uh, Monica, they have those good noses. They can pick food out of anywhere. Wow, yeah. And today we're still getting areas of flurries coming in through the high country. That low pressure system that brought us the active weather over the past two days just doesn't want to lose its grip. So you can see a few flurries up there for the high country, down low for the valley, a few isolated showers. So that low is going to move out of the region. Another one on the move coming in from the Pacific, but it doesn't look like it's going to be very impactful. At this point in the season, we're really in that transition zone. We come out of the heavy precipitation that we typically see the prior months and start to see our chance of rain and snow dwindling for April and certainly May. It is a likely drier scenario for the long range forecast, but also likely warmer. And one thing to keep in mind is when we start to see those warmer conditions, we start to see snow melt where in some areas we're at historic high numbers, anywhere from about 188% of normal to almost 300% of normal throughout this year. And all of that will eventually melt into our reservoirs, our lakes, our streams. And we have to be aware that we could see some spring flooding. Today, we still kept that snowpack intact with highs only in the 30s for the Sierra, near 50 for the foothills and close to 60 for the valley. That's still relatively cool. We should be closer to about 70 this time of year. And we're going to stay in that slightly cooler scenario for the next couple of days here. Highs for our Friday forecast will warm to near 60. We'll see a light southwest wind starting the morning off at 45 degrees with a mix of sun and clouds. Again, to wrap up what's been a very active work week. Another couple of weather systems passing to the north of us will keep us with a slight chance for showers into our forecast deep into our weekend. So Saturday and Sunday for the Sierra mainly is when we're going to see a chance of those snow flurries coming in, totaling anywhere from about 8 to almost 18 inches of additional snow. Bottom line there, keep the chains handy. Highs for tomorrow in the 30s for the Sierra to near 40. We're in the 40s and 50s for the foothills. Across the coast, still relatively cool. Highs in the 50s to near 60, and we'll see that as well for inland areas. Highs will be close to about 60, about 10 degrees cooler than average. Well, our five-day forecast for the region-wide outlook calls for some active weather early next week. Wind as well, but then we start to see some calmer weather and warmer conditions as well. Chance the showers early next week, but next weekend we're in the 70s. 
March is Women's History Month, and as the month comes to a close, we're focusing on the trades. Maybe it's all those men working signs, but you probably don't think about women when you picture people like electricians or construction workers. That's probably because men make up the vast majority of those fields. But with the help of producer Ayana Williams, we're introducing you to some women working to change that. So Tradeswomen Inc. is a nonprofit, woman-centric organization that recruits women into the blue collar workforce, the non-traditional trades such as construction. So we've been around since 1971, so 44 years. In 2019, they realized that the need to get more women into the trades in the Central Valley, so they hired me as a Central Valley Program Coordinator. I do a lot of outreach in my territory, and that kind of consist of just really promoting and educating women on the different types of construction trades that are out there if they want to, you know, kind of navigate that career pathway. I help them with like aptitude prep, test prep, some of the soft skills. We want them to be able, or I would like to see women be able to get into the trades but feel confident in, in getting into these male-dominated construction trades, if you will. In my three years of working with Tradeswomen Inc., we have seen an increase in women from Sacramento County to San Joaquin County pursue a career uh, in construction. I want to say it's, it's been well over a hundred women getting into the trades. As a woman working in a trade that's uh, male dominant, it's tough. You get a lot of males discouraging you. Why are you here? You should be at home cooking and cleaning. So I work a lot with concrete, so I do a lot of setting forms and pouring concrete. I've been doing it for four years now, so it's a long, long time for doing such, such a tough work. Don't let anybody make you feel bad for what you're doing just because you're a woman. You get that a lot. I've got that. That was my experience. They told me I didn't belong, but now they see me in the magazines for Local 300, so. Money, power, respect. That's what you get when you get into a union trade. The money, equal pay. I've never worked in an industry where women didn't make less than men. As it stands right now, women get paid approximately 82 cents to the man's dollar, but not in the trades. The women make the same amount equal to their male counterparts, if you will. And I just think that's absolutely amazing. If I have become successful, I want to take the next woman and say, hey, look, if I can do it, you can do it. A lot of women feel discouraged. They're like, ah, it's male dominated. Ah, I don't really know about you know working with my hands. If there is a, a goal that you want to pursue, you don't want someone to just tell you, oh, this isn't for you. This isn't for a woman. You know, woman's place is in the kitchen. It's, it's not. Women can do, we're, we're very successful tradespeople. What we do in any construction trade is not easy, but if you like doing what you like to do, don't let that get to your head. Like, just, just keep doing you, and if you like to work hard, just show them. And then in the end, they'll just leave you alone, and they'll be like, oh, this girl knows what she's doing. We need her help here. What I'm most proud about is really seeing other women succeed and knowing that I may have had a hand in knocking down some of those barriers that they faced. I want to repeat something Selena said there. Federal stats show the gender pay gap is virtually non-existent in the labor force. If you want to get into the trades with the help of Trade Women Inc., we've got everything you need to know on abc10.com slash to the point. We'll be right back. Check it out. April is Autism Awareness Month, and Knee Deep Brewing, Knee Deep Brewing Company in Auburn is raising awareness with a new brew. It's called Hoppy Roger and is benefiting local organization Pride Industries. Marcus Allen was at the brewery to speak with the people producing the product. Your bosses and your boss's bosses say that you're one of the best employees they've ever had. How does that make you feel? Pretty good. You, know, you got a lot of thirsty, thirsty people, so I keep them happy. Deep Brewing says many of their employees are on the autism spectrum. Those employees are even featured on the new brew's label. 
Now, before you go, you've noticed Alex isn't here. That's because she's hosting the Carmichael Chamber of Commerce Community Awards Gala. The event is celebrating small businesses and 75 years of growth in Carmichael. Many people are being honored, including business owners, educators, and community leaders. So congratulations to them. And as always, we want to hear from you. Keep the comments coming. We read everyone. Send us a text to 916-321-3310 or shoot an email at tothepoint at abc10.com. Hey, it's Alex. Just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. I really love hearing from everyone, and I hope that you'll stay in touch. Reach out to me on Facebook at Alex Bell TV, or you can email me at to the point at abc10.com, or you can even send me a text message at 916 321 3310.